Hello. Hey everyone, Jeff here. Um, welcome to another episode of BIM After Dark Live. Um, first things first, um, I'm, I'm in the process of upgrading some of the audio and visual in here, so um, hopefully you guys can hear me okay. Um, I'm still waiting for some components to come in, but um, um, <laughs> we're going to work with it. They didn't come in in time. So uh, as far as I can tell, it looks like the levels are okay. Uh, so let me know if you can hear me okay. Um, but yeah, welcome to another episode. This is, believe it or not, this is episode 25 of BIM After Dark Live. Um, so I'm Jeff, uh, also known as The Revit Kid. I run a, a blog called therevitkid.com and also a community membership slash learning platform for Revit um, called BIM After Dark. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about that throughout today's uh, session. Um, but uh, welcome. If you're a new um, viewer, thank you for joining. Um, if you don't mind, make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. I think this is, and and hit the notifications so you know when I'm going live next. Also, head over to um, the the RevitKid.com and you can sign up for my mailing list. Um, this show, if you're new here, this is a weekly um, live stream that I've been doing for the last 25 weeks in a row. And uh, we talk about all things Revit, BIM, and and adjacent software related. And so um, if you're interested in seeing the previous 25 episodes, head over to live.bimafterdark.com. I'll post it right in the chat as well so you guys can check them out. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, welcome. Today's going to be fun. Today we're going to be talking about topography. And um, it's just one of those things um, where... I was teaching um, my class um, at the University of Hartford, um, which I teach uh, every semester now. And we were, we were going through some topography things and I thought about um, this being probably a good topic to, to touch on during this live session. So um, a quick reminder, this is live. Um, so I'm gonna do my best in between to keep an eye on the chat. So feel free to ask questions, jump in. I will do my best to keep up if it's extremely busy. Sometimes it's hard to, you know, to, to to, to catch up with your questions, so I apologize ahead of time, but I want this to be interactive and um, and I want you to to feel engaged. So thank you for joining. If you're a returning visitor or viewer, thank you very much. Or if you're looking at this in the future, not live, thank you for checking it out. So um, welcome, hello, uh, Jose and, and, and Mona and Alden and Robert and all, all you guys, Peter. What's up, everyone? Thanks, thanks for joining. This is really cool. So um, today it's it's actually twelve thirty in the afternoon here on the East Coast. Um, I've been trying some different times. Um, I believe next week it'll be in the night night time again for East Coast, um, just based on the guest schedule. Um, so just let me know, um, shoot me an email or something if if you guys have a preferred time. But so far, um, it seems to help those of you across the pond over in Europe uh, when I do a twelve thirty, um, but maybe not um, in Australia or something like that. So. I'm doing my best here for live live sessions. Either way, they're always recorded and they're visible afterwards on uh, live.bimafterdark.com. And last little piece that I wanted to mention here is um, a lot of people ask me after these sessions um, where they can get some some of the resources or some of the some of the things that I've mentioned um, throughout these these sessions. And so one of the one of the best places is. Um, to see my free resources, I have a whole bunch of free resources, is at free.bimafterdark.com. I just posted a link in the in the chat, and there you'll find cheat sheets to um, family making, um, Dynamo. Um, there's some uh, in some eBooks on on Revit for design, and there's also a free course on um, going from Revit to Twin Motion 2020. So definitely check that out. Again, that's free.bimafterdark.com, and I'm I'm linking it in the chat in the description below. So without further ado, ooh, I just hit the mic. Look at that. <laughs> Still getting used to this whole setup here. So without further ado, we're going to jump into topography today. Topography is one of those things that um, I mention it and some Revit users will automatically run away screaming. And I get it. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but there's also some, as much as a frustration as it is, there's also some really, really cool things you can do with it. So I'm hoping to just show you some of the, some of the little tips, tricks, and techniques that, that myself and my, my team have, have developed over the years of making um, way too many site models in Revit, as far as I'm concerned. Um, before I jump in, I wanted to ask one question for everyone to, to answer on the chat, um, just because just I'm curious. Um, you know, wh what is your... What is your most frustrating thing about topography in Revit? Just one thing. Don't go on too many rants because you'll just flood the chat, but that's okay if you do. Uh, what is your most frustrating thing about topography in Revit? So feel free to hit hit the chat and, and let us know um, what you're frustrated about. 
So without further ado, I'm just going to check the chat. By the way, I will. There's a little bit of a delay, so I'm going to do my best to check the chat and go in between. That's just kind of the format that we have set up here. Um, hello, hello. We got some. Oh, Freddie. Hello, Freddie. How are you? Awesome. Awesome. Kevin from Scotland. Sweet. What's up, Kevin? And then Jose. How's it going, Jose? Awesome. Okay. So I'm just going to jump right into it. I've got I've got some notes here of, of just some of the things that I wanted to touch on today, depending on if we go way off course um, based on your comments. Uh, we may we may go off course, but I'm going to at least touch on some of these little tips and tricks that I that I have um, that hopefully will help you guys go. And so um, looks like we've got um, already people commenting in about some of the most frustrating things. So awesome. All right, let's let's jump in. OK. Topography. <laughs> so I would say <clears throat> my my number one um, most important tip when it comes to Revit and topography for you is, if at all possible, don't use it. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I know uh, a lot of people, even on Twitter, when I mentioned the top topic, there was a few people that were mentioning why would you even use it, blah 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 blah. So um, if your site is flat or even relatively flat. Um, then use floors or roofs or something like that to, to model it. And so for, for example here, um, if I jump over to this view, you know, this is a, this is a, a more urban site. And if you, if you look these right here, all these things you're seeing here, these are all floors. Okay. If I isolate this, this is a floor. Um, the site, you know, obviously in, in the real world, it's not flat there there's there's you know a couple feet slope between it but generally speaking and depending on what you're doing right if you're a civil engineer or you're doing some extremely detailed drawings and you, then you're going to need to model topography right it, it makes sense but you can get away even with some slope with using floors and, and modeling that way so my very first tip for sure is to to <laughs> if you don't have to use revit topography don't use it because it is a pain in the butt but when you get to a site like for example this one here where you have a 900 foot um, difference between the top of your topography map and this river here, um, it's kind of difficult to use floors to show that, right? It, it's just, it's not feasible. Um, depending on what your end goal is, um, it's just not, it doesn't make much sense. Okay, so, so we're gonna talk about situations today where you have to use topography or you need to use topography or you want to use topography. Um, so yes, I understand. And I know a lot of people are going to say, just use floors with points and do your thing. Yeah. And that works. That works. But it, it's not nearly as valuable or useful when you have a site like the one I'm looking at here, which is a gigantic uh, site with tons and tons and tons and tons of, of points and topography. So first thing I want to show you guys is something that has, uh, I've been a tutorial on my blog for many years, but every time I mention it, um, um, it seems to be valuable to people. So I'm going to mention it here because it is probably one of the most valuable tips that, that I've ever discovered or developed for topography. And that is using the auto clicker. Okay. So really quick, this site, as you can see here, this site, uh, the other thing I'll mention with this site, the site you're looking at here is this is a gigantic site and um, we did not have a survey drawing. So we did not have a CAD plan to use and import. So these were manually, this was a manually drawn site. What I mean by that is if I was to click, I probably shouldn't even do this live because there's so many points. If I was to click edit surface, um, you will see the points. This is a big site, so it probably wasn't a great idea to do the edit points live, but <laughs> uh, we're on the fly here. <clears throat> And you'll see there's a whole bunch of points in here. These are all manually drawn by hand. But the thing that I want to show you guys is that if I go to the site plan here, okay, I am not, I am not going into Revit. I'm not going to massing and site to topo surface, clicking zero and click, 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 and getting carpal tunnel, right? That's how you and and probably anyone you ever known um, who uses Revit has created topography, right? Um, so if you only have an image, which let's face it, a lot of times that's what we have, there are some techniques that you can use to actually create topo faster. And so one of my absolute favorites is what I call the auto clicker technique. Um, I will post a link to the blog post from a few years back um, so you can get the download link to the actual um, auto clicker um, a tool, um, but I'm going to open it here so you guys can see. So auto clicker is just a Windows tool that somebody created um, a while back, <laughs> a long while back, 
And uh, I think it was actually created for RuneScape, the video game. But either way, um, what's great about it is it just auto clicks. So you set a time, so 100 milliseconds, 150 milliseconds, whatever it is, you set the time and then it just clicks every 100 milliseconds. Okay, you don't have to click, so that's the key. So you'll notice starting and stopping it, um, you can set these differently, but right now it's F6, which is great because in Revit, F6 doesn't do anything. So I'm gonna set it to 100 milliseconds. I'm gonna set it to, or I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave this open in the background. I'm gonna go to place a point. You'll notice, here's my, here's my lines, right? There's 550, 600, blah, blah, blah. So I'm gonna start with 600 right here. I'm gonna type 600 feet in my options toolbar. And then all I have to do is press F6. And it's drawing. Uh, you might not be able to see it. There's a little lag. Let me go into a clean file that doesn't have a thousand things. But you can see it's drawing there. So let me let me go into a clean file real quick. I forgot that given that that thing has um, hundreds and hundreds of points, um, we'll do a clean file so you can see it. So if I do 10 feet, all I have to do is press F6 on my keyboard. Hope, uh, sorry if you guys heard those warnings. <laughs> so F6 on my keyboard, and I'm actually not clicking right now. I'm just moving my mouse as if I'm tracing. Okay, and then I press F6 again and it stops. So if I wanna go to 15 feet, do it again. And I'm just tracing, I'm not clicking anymore. So anyone out there who feels like they, um, they need to wear a wrist brace because they've built topography in Revit um, for the last two years, hopefully, this can help you, okay? And so there you go, now I have topography built and all I'm doing is move my mouse. I'm not physically clicking, which is super cool. So again, that's that's auto clicker and the download link is in the blog post that I just posted on there. Super simple, it's a .exe that you just keep on your machine, you launch it, you don't even need to install it, um, but massive, massive value. So for, for anyone who, who brings in images and I know plenty of you do um, in order to build topography, the first thing you gotta do is start, start using auto clicker. I'm gonna quickly check the chat before I move on to anything else. Um, a couple people, um, <laughs> a lot of people have the same frustrations um, with 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 sight. Um, lots of um, uh, roads and retaining walls and and floors and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Understood. Understood. Things following it, right? Awesome. Cool. Looks like a lot of people didn't know about auto clicker, which is even better. So definitely check it out. It's 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 gonna be a, a game changer for you if you've if you've ever sat there and manually clicked to pl create sites. That's so cool. Um, <clears throat> okay, so hopefully that also showed you quickly how 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 a, a, a topography is made in Revit, which is which is pretty neat. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Sorry, I was just trying to get back to the camera there. So there you go. So first, first tip, first tip of the day is use the auto clicker. Keep it on your machine, launch it, and don't forget about it because I promise you, it's going to save not only you a bunch of time, but it's going to save you a whole heck of a lot of wrist pain. Um, somebody asked if it's free. Yes, auto clicker is free download. Like I said, I, I posted in the chat the link, and I'll also post it in the description below. Um, to it um, where I show you how to use it, but I also show you where to download it from. The one thing I will mention is it's free and open source, and so right now it's still accessible, but um, I it, hopefully the link doesn't disappear, and if it does, I guess I'll, I'll keep the EXE somewhere and I'll, I'll maybe host it on my own on my own drive or something, but I believe it's just a Creative Commons. Uh, somebody developed it, so, so definitely check it out. All right, glad that was helpful. So now, before we move into actual site modeling stuff, there's something that I needed to bring up because this is such a common question and such a common thing that I see um, with students especially, but uh, I see it across across the board too. And so um, it has to do with with the site, um, the, the topography fill in like a building section or elevation, um, and also not being able to see some of your topo, topo surface um um, lines, so your your primary contours or your secondary contours. So let's jump over to screen and camera. All right. Um, actually, before I move on, real quick, um, Paul asked, "How do you handle steep slopes and drop offs?" <clears throat> well, that's a perfect example where where um, where something like the um, auto clicker can help a lot because really, I mean, unless you're doing retaining walls, which we'll talk about in a second or, or something like that, but really the the, the best way to do steep slopes is to have extremely tight points, 
right? Because the problem with steep slopes is if this is at 15 feet and then I do one at 20 feet, right? What's gonna happen is depending on where these are and then you have maybe, that's probably not that steep of a slope. And then maybe you have ones at five feet in here. Um, so what happens is you're gonna get points that connect in between, you know, like stuff like this, and it starts getting getting kind of kind of kind of crummy, right? And so what you need is you need extremely tight points when you're doing steep slopes. So you need your points to be, you know, as absolutely tight as humanly possible so that they don't go through it. And so that's a perfect example of where something like the auto clicker comes into play because um, when when you have the auto clicker running, oops, I apologize, I just open outlook instead of auto clicker <laughs> when you have the auto clicker running everything's opening on the other monitor go figure what you can do is you can move slower so if i press f6 you'll see you almost can't even see the points that's how many points it's placing and then i can stop f6 and then i can do you know a 20 foot shear wall here i can zoom in even tighter if i press f6 Remember, it's it's clicking every, it's clicking every. I'm sorry about that. I need to close Outlook. <laughs> it's clicking every um, 100 milliseconds. So as you can see, I've got points that are extremely extremely tight together. So that allows me to create this wall here, which, as you can see, is almost vertical at this point. So that's the wall that was just created. Okay, so that's. Anything that's that's tight tight like that, or anything that's extremely uh, steep like that, that's what you want to do. You want to. Sorry, I just need to close Outlook so you guys don't hear that all day long again. Um, so, because you you just want the points to be extremely extremely tight when it comes to steep slopes. Okay. Awesome. All right, let's do this. <laughs> oh, somebody said, ah, my CPU. Yes. I mean, in general with Revit, if you're using extremely large sites and you start you start building tons and tons of points, it is going to slow some things down. Um, as you saw before when I was trying to edit that other Tobo, it would work, but I just, doing this live, I don't I don't have the time to wait for Revit's freaking loading bar to go. Okay. So what did I, what did I want to talk about now? I want to talk about the um, visibility of site and, and an issue that I see all the time. So I'm looking at this floor plan here, and this is the same topography. Um, but why is the one on the right hand side, why does that have secondary contours uh, but the left hand side only has primary contours? Okay. Reason being is the one on the left hand side is actually starting. If I do a quick, um, spot elevation, you can see this one goes from zero feet to negative 24 feet. This one goes from 25 feet to zero feet. Okay, so what does that mean? That means if I look at these sections, here's my slope of the first one, and here's my slope of the second one. Okay, when it comes to topography and visibility, um, if you're running into these issues, I see it all the time. I see this especially where you have the disappearing um, disappearing filled region so like your building if you had a building here and and your and your foundation went below 10 feet or whatever this is below uh topography i mean i'll even show it here let's just draw it real quick so if, if i drew a wall in here and the bottom of that wall was negative 20 feet for whatever reason and i click it in here right if this is our building look my building is going beyond my topography kind of strange right i see this all the time Okay. And the other aspect of it is if you go into site, um, I also see this where it's like, why am I not getting secondary contours? Why am I not getting secondary contours? So I'm going to show you a really, really secret dialogue box that not many people know about under massing in site, where it says model site and your topography or topo surface and site components are, there's a little teeny down arrow on the bottom right of that dialogue. So that's under massing, massing in site tab. And on the bottom right, there's a little teeny arrow. If you click that, there's all these special settings. Yes, settings that not many people even know existed. It took me a long time to even realize these existed. I honestly don't remember when I discovered it, but what you'll notice is that your contour lines, there's settings for these. You can actually you can actually have third and fourth and fifth contour lines. So you can manage these all, all differently. Um, you can see your increments are one feet, but what you'll notice is that the start and stop your start of your contours is actually at zero feet. 
your stop is at 1,000 feet. It's like, well, and I'm not saying that, and I'm not, I'm not even um, promoting the idea of, of, of you know, starting your buildings at zero and going down from there. But let's be honest, we do that a lot, right? We start our buildings at zero, which means our basement floor might be negative nine, which means our footings might be negative 12, or maybe we have two levels underground, three levels, right? That happens. It's just depending on how the project's set up. So we're not going to get into that argument today. But what I want to say is that your contour lines actually start at zero. So if you have any site that's below zero, you're not going to see your contour lines. So if you change this to negative 1,000, for example, for your start of your contours and your stop at 1,000, if you click apply, you'll notice now this, this top topography on the left-hand side, which is negative 25, I can see my secondary contours, which is awesome. So now let's talk about that, that earth hatch, right? Remember that earth hatch just disappears at some point? Um, here, I'll go back to it so you can see. So if I go into here, my earth hatch just sort of disappears, even though my topo goes down there, right? Well, if I go back into those settings, look at this. There's a global override for your cut material of topography. And so that's the material. It's called earth. But notice this, the elevation of the poche base. So for whatever reason, the poche of your site stops at negative 10 feet. So whether you're doing solid white, solid black, or earth hatch, it's always going to stop at 10 feet below zero. So if I change this to negative 1,000 as well, look at that. Now my site goes on forever. But if I'm making a visual, I can crop this up, and it at least looks correct. I don't deal with that disappearing hatch anymore. Okay, same thing over here. So the tip number two for today is to explore this modeling and site settings area. If you haven't, check it out. If you have, good for you. <laughs> but I can tell you right now, the amount of projects that I've seen, whether it's students or even professionals, where um, um, either either they override their topography, that's a, a key one, right? How many projects have you seen where, where people are putting detail or, or um, filled regions as topography because they can't figure out how to get that stuff to go down or above or et cetera? Um, well, that's, that's one way. Hey, Marcelo's here. What's up, Marcelo? <laughs> check out, uh, you, if you guys want to see uh, a couple episodes with Marcelo, check out um, live.bimafterdark.com. Uh, Marcelo did a, a really cool uh, uh, Q&A with myself and Paul Aubin way back in the beginning of this series. And then he came on and, and did, a, did a really neat episode uh, talking about um, Rhino inside Revit. So definitely check that out. You can see all the previous episodes again at live.bimafterdark. Um, before I jump on, so... That was the site settings dialogue. So let me, um, I'm going to read a couple comments, make sure that we, we don't move on without any, any questions. Um, so that was the site settings. So don't forget the site settings under massing and site. And then there's that little teeny arrow thing down there. Um, one question I just saw was, can, can is there any way that we can get these sample files? Um, so all of the sample files to all of my tutorials, literally every tutorial, and if there's one you can't find, you ask me, are available to members of the BIM After Dark community. So, um, this sample file, the ones that you're going to see in a little bit, which is it, uh, has all these really cool um, railing types and, and, and site families, um, are going to be available immediately after this tutorial for members. And so if you're interested in becoming a member and access to all of my um, sample files, literally all of them, um, for any tutorial you've ever seen on the blog, uh, including all the courses and, and stuff like that, um, just head over to community.bimafterdark.com. I just posted a link down there. Um, so... If you're interested in any of that at all, check that out. Um, I do have some sample files for free on the site, but for the most part, um, I like to, to, to put them to members, um, mainly for a couple different reasons, but uh, mainly so that there's a place I can host and access them. All right. Um, Matthew just asked, um, can't you create 2D contours and then assign elevations to them? Ye sure. <laughs> but drawing 2d contour so i think what you're saying is whether it's in revit or in cad um sitting there and drawing a spline that follows your contour line and then setting the elevation and then importing them and creating a mass if you think that's any more efficient than just using the point tool and auto clicker and tracing it then fine but honestly it's the same thing to me right i mean you're still tracing the contours with 2d lines clicking them setting the elevation and then doing it a thousand times um Sure, but yes, you can. You can you can use CAD or another program to create polylines um, that are are actual elevation, and then you can import them and create a topo surface from import. 
I will warn you that when you do that, um, your best, the most efficient way to manage that is actually keeping that contour file as a link and being able to modify the contour file, which can be a pain in the butt. So, um, so yes, you can. Um, personally, I don't see much more of a benefit to it in this situation. The best bet would be you have a civil engineer or a surveyor on the job who created a three-dimensional CAD plan, and then you can import them and start from there. But I'm trying to give you some ideas for when you don't, because let's be honest, that doesn't happen at every single job. Okay. <laughs> um, I just want to check some of the chat, you guys, before I move on here. A um, couple questions about curves and stuff. I'm going to talk about that that kind of that that in a second here. All right. <clears throat> okay. Sweet. So site designers. Uh, uh, sorry, the site setting dialogues is what I want to show you. So now, this is this is sort of one of the things. This has been a game changer for us. Um, so one of the things that you'll notice, um, if I share screen and overlay. Is and as I mentioned in in my in my email to you guys to sort of set it up and the description to this video, we, we I build a lot of sites. Um, you know, on the architecture side of things, they're built usually for visuals, but a lot of times even on the contractor side of things. So the work I do with Turner Construction, uh, we are building a ton of site because the, part of what we do is is visualize the construction um, and obviously site and context when it comes to logistics of site planning and methods and means and, and, and moving through uh, a, a job have a lot to do with the site. So we do find ourselves building sites a lot. Um, and so, you know, some of the things that we're doing a lot are things like construction fencing, which you're seeing here, um, utilities, um, whether it's for visuals or actual coordination or just general phasing. And so, I mean, here's an example here where um, you basically wouldn't be able to use floors for this site, right? I mean, look at this thing. It, it just, it, it's not, it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. Um, and then, you know, as I showed you before in that, um, more urban site, you know, this one here, which, um, what you'll see is that there's also, um, you know, the existing site, but then there's a site with excavation. And so here's an example where, where floors can come into play. So this is me using floors and we're just using edit points. Um, so modifying the sub elements. So for those of you who don't know that, I, was, I wasn't actually going to talk about this, but I know people mentioned it, so I might as well. For those of you that don't know um, what modifying the sub elements of a floor are, um, you'll notice that this floor is actually sloping. If I zoom in a little, it's sloping into the site. So that's kind of our ramp to get into our site. So I'll go over to the clean file and just show you just real quickly, because I know some people may not be familiar with this process. So if I had, if I had a floor, so I'll just model a floor here. It's a generic 12 inch floor. We'll just say that this is our site. Okay, so I'm gonna go in 3D so everyone can see it. Okay, so there's our topo there, this is our site. So what people are talking about when they say using floors is if you, when you're in a floor, if you click modify sub elements, you can actually modify and tweak parts and pieces and layers of the floor. But not only that, you can actually add points. So if I was to take this point here though, and say go up 10 feet, press enter, you'll notice that it's actually warping and, and moving the floor to get up to that 10 feet area, right? For some reason, the edge isn't showing, which is kind of weird. Um, but I can also add points, so I can add a point somewhere along this line. And now you can see, oops edit modify sub elements now i can take this point and i can actually move this up and i actually i can start flexing this floor okay so that's what people are talking about when they say using floors um personally like i said i try to avoid that as much as possible unless need be but it is it is a route or it is a way into it so like for example on that on that on that sample that i was showing you here with the site um i have so many tabs open now with the site here um this is a good example because we're, we're considering the entire site being flat but then we need to show our excavation. We need to show a, a, a ramp going into it. So what a perfect example of just modifying the floor and moving those, those sub elements so that it shows a ramp going in. Okay. But really the biggest, the absolute biggest thing, um, game changing, um, device for us, as far as modeling site was back in 2018, 17, I don't remember what year it was, but when, when Revit and the folks at Autodesk decided to let us host railings to floors okay so what you'll notice as i move around this particular site we've got this this post and rail um wall or uh, fence we've got a retaining wall here we've got a retaining wall here and a retaining wall here 
We've got site fences, and notice they all follow topography. So what does that tell you? That tells you that we are using fences for everything, or railings for everything, okay? Railings being hosted to topography, when you start to think outside the box of what railings can and can't do, um, is a game changer, right? Railings are what? They're a sweep along a path um, where you can have a repetitive element in them, and then they can also follow a surface. I mean, that's everything you dreamed of when it comes to topography. So here, right here, this is actually our, our construction fence and railing file that we use at Turner and I use for most of my most of my site modeling stuff. Um, this is just a glimpse into some of the families that we've created to do what we need with topography. Again, community members do get this uh, uh, and I'll post it immediately following this um, stream. So tech, check out community.bimafterdark.com if you're interested. Um, but look at this, we've got a guardrail, we've got striping, Look at what this striping is following. And the sketch for this, all right, if I go into it, it's just a line. It's one single line, all right? Look at this here, retaining walls. Why not, right? We could use retaining walls. Guess what else? Earth retention, okay? Why is this cool? Because, of course, this I did it on a flat area. But let's just say we're, you're digging into a site with a slope. So let us... Um, let me, let me dig into this site. Let me go into massing and site, building pad. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say I'm digging into the site right here. Okay, of course I did not dig into anywhere where it was sloped. Let me try that again. Well, that is sloped now. So now we finally got a little bit of slope here. If I take this pad and I say, I don't know, this is, a, this is an eight foot hole. Okay, and then ba-boom, if I model this guy, I'm just doing create similar, do finish, and then if I pick new host and I select it, check this out. Oops, let me offset it. Offset six inches, don't copy it. Click finish. There we go. I just took it out of the host, so let me try that again. <laughs> try that again. Okay. So I gotta flip it, but you see the retaining wall, check that out. Or the, the earth retention is actually following it. And again, these are all just railing families. So when it comes to striping, when it comes to um, dash line, look at this is, this is dash striping. So imagine how fast if you Instead of drawing subregions for everything, not to mention, by the way, anyone who's actually used subregions um, to the extent of trying to stripe a parking lot, for example, um, you will know that Revit does some really weird things when you have too many subregions and sketches and topography, like to the point where sometimes you're missing topography and you don't understand why. So how do I create striping in a parking lot? Easy, you can just take, I mean, for this, I can actually just copy and paste this guy. So if I copy and paste this down here, you'll notice it's actually now hosted down here, which is perfect, right? And these, these are railings. So these are just single sketches or multiple sketches, depending on how you want to look at them, right? But then I can also, if I want to do street striping, I can pull this around here, click finish. Now I have striping, or if I want it to be dashed, I have a dashed as well. There's your dash striping, okay? Sorry, I'm just checking the chat as we go along here. So pretty cool, right? So what I'm gonna do is I wanna show show you how some of these railings are built, um, just so you get a sense of it. But the reality is when you start thinking about that, think about all the things that you can do with this, right? The one thing I will mention when you're using railings is that, um, as you can see, I have this arc here. For some reason, when you're using arcs and curves um, and you're hosted with a railing to topography, it can run into some issues depending on how this how the railing is built and so um, a lot of times what we end up doing is actually segmenting our arcs um, just for the sake of revit being able to file the topo this one actually is doing a pretty good job but you will run into issues um, so most of the time we're segmenting arcs just for the sake of that but otherwise for the most part it works pretty good so let me just let me just uh, read some chat before i move on to those <laughs> um, 
it looks like people are using roofs all the time, which is pretty, pretty awesome. Um, yes, railing is parking striping. Yes. <laughs> I, um, any of these things, right? Any of these things can be, I mean, a wall is a perfect example, right? If I go back to that example here, notice I have a couple versions of it. If you, these are just field stone walls that are out in the middle of nowhere, right? But you need them to follow the topo. And so that's what this is. This is just a wall and I can make it more clean, but for the sake of what we're doing, and it's actually following the topography. And all it is, is a single line. It's just me drawing one single line as opposed to doing all the crazy hacks that you guys may have seen in the past. Um, Marcelo's on here, so I, I, I'll i never forget the hack that you had with exporting uh, the DWG corner of like a of a pad and then importing it back in so you could pick the lines, right? No longer have to do that. Not not even not even an issue. Um, Paul says subregions only end in tiers. Yes, they do. <laughs> so picking apart how I built that other site before I jump into the railings then, you'll notice um, there are subregions in here. And this one I didn't end up striping the parking lot just for the sake of timing, but uh, there are subregions in here. But if I was to do some some parking striping and stuff, I would use railings. I would not use I would not use subregions. Whereas I think the this one here, um, this guy, are these railings? These might be railings too. Yeah. So these are all railings here. These are not subregions. So you'll notice the street is subregions, but all of the all of the the paint is actually railings. Because again, you just have more freedom trying to do this in subregions, as everyone out there clearly uh, can attest to. Because uh, just from reading the comments, I could tell um, that that's that's not a fun way to do things. Okay. So let's see. But walls are profiles, not walls per per se, right? Correct, Jose. So I'm gonna I'm gonna show you sort of how these things are built um, in a second. Um, but let me just make sure. Oh. Ali, um, one one question before I move on. Ali just asked. Um, I know you. I know you. You must get asked this a lot. But how how come or how do you make Revit look that cool? I'm assuming you're talking about the visual style of it. Um, so for that, I have an entire course on making Revit look sexier. Um, that's within that community as well. So again, that's community community dark dot com. But also, if you just dig through the blog and you search for um, sexy Revit or Revit presentation, I do have some of my settings somewhere out there um, as posts, and I'll post them in the descriptions here. But um, most of it is just graphic settings, man. There's just specific graphic settings. Okay. So uh, back to um, what Jose was saying about um, the wall. So let me just show you a couple of you guys how 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 these are built. So this, this is a perfect example. And obviously it's not gonna be perfect because you are these are sweeps and everyone who's used railings knows that railings are not perfect. Um, but for the sake of most of what you'd be doing, it's beyond close enough. Um, so if I go into this stone wall, I go into rail structure, you'll see these are just simply profiles, man. Stone wall path, parking stripe, right? They're just rectangular profiles. So if I open one of those profiles, rectangular handrail. I'm just using the default rectangular handrail. There's a stone wall path right here, two foot six by two foot. If I wanted to change the height of it so that it digs into the dirt, the earth more, I can say four feet. You can see now it's digging into the earth more, right? For some reason, there's a, there's a post in this one. I don't know what happened there. Let me go to baluster. You should have baluster set to none. I don't, I'm not really sure why that's not set to none. So if you say baluster is all set to none, and you have a path just like that, a two foot six, then all you're doing is creating a sweep that's hosted to a surface. That's it. Guess what? The striping is the same thing. If I isolate the striping, it's just a sweep that's hosted to the surface. The one thing you will have to mess with is where the offset is and how much you want this to be uh, sticking above your above your um, your site. But otherwise, that's it. It's just a sweep <laughs> that's hosted to a surface, um, and you get rid of you get rid of your your um, your balusters, um, you know, same thing. You know, these are actual railings, basically. So if you know how to make a railing, you know, these are these are all just railing types. And then striping, you know, striping is a, is a unique one. So in order to get striping, um, guess what? We don't have any profiles, right? Because we need it to be dashed. But think about it. We have the ability to place um, an element in a pattern along a path using a railing, right? So if we use balusters. We have a baluster family called striping dashed one inch. All right, so if I open that baluster family, my uh, microphone's in the way here. Hold on a second. Woo, woo. <laughs> so if I go into railings, 
balusters. And I probably just, I probably didn't even make a new one actually. Let's see. Baluster square. Nope. Here, striping dashed. So here's my baluster family. If I go into edit, this is what it looks like. It's pretty simple. It's just a long, okay, it didn't even, it didn't even put parameters on it for that. Must have been going quick. So it's just a, a long rectangle, right? But then I'm telling it, okay, Revit, every, every so, uh, every X number of feet. I don't even know what projects I have open anymore, guys. I'm sorry, I'm flipping through projects like this, but it is the nature of tabs in Revit without knowing what the heck project they belong to. And I know uh, John, John and Parallax, you guys sent me this stuff. I just never installed it. Sorry. <laughs> Let me close all of these. Where on earth did my railing family go? There it is. How many of you guys have ever done that? Just click through all your damn tabs until you get to the project you want. Okay. <clears throat> so then this is just a baluster that if I go under edit baluster, you know, you could see it's, you know, top, top offset is one inch and then it's, it's, um, every, however many feet I have it set to, um, from the host and then it's good to go. That's it. Um, so Suresh, S Suresh mentioned, so railing is cool, but when you export to FBX, the file size becomes heavy. Um, that's true of anything in Revit. Um, when you're exporting FBX, you have to export um, and pay attention to what you're looking at. And I'll tell you from experience, all those files I just showed you are all FBX files that were done in twin motion and they're all manageable. So one thing I will mention is if you're using the default Revit X FBX exporter, um, it's not the best at optimizing. If you're using the twin motion exporter, which even if you're not a twin motion user, you can use, just install it. Um, the export for um, Revit optimized, they have a, a mesh setting for optimized. And I think I mentioned this in one of the last sessions where I talked about twin motion. It's really, really good. Okay, so so it's extremely good at compressing files, um, not necessarily ruining the, the graphics. It might, but um, curves are the worst, um, obviously. And then um, steel beams, for example, that have curves and chamfers, you just set it to medium. So yes, I understand what you're saying. You're going to add a little bit, of, a little bit of, 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 of heaviness to the model, but totally worth it. Um, Josh just mentioned site designer tools. <laughs> Don't even bother wasting your time learning those. All right. Um, let me make sure we don't have any questions here. Do you use phasing and graded regions? Paul, great questions, actually. Um, I I would say, so depending on what you're doing for your site in topography, um, let me, uh, depending on what you're doing for your site in topography, um, you, you may have to, right? And so I do have a tutorial, which I'll pull up um, in the description after, after we go live for how to use graded regions and calculate fills and cuts and stuff like that. And so if you need to, and you need to manage that within your file and use that information, then by all means use phasing. Um, phasing and site, just um, especially if you start using pads and hosting, it, it, it can be an absolute pain in the butt. Um, so for the most part with, with what we're doing um, with phased logistics, like I was just showing you, um, we're actually just using design options for most of those. So the sites may exist in the same phase, but they're existing in their own design options. Um, and that's mainly because when you think about um, a, a construction sequence, it's it would be more like a million phases between existing and new construction. So then the design options kind of fill it in, um, making a site demo, making phasing and demo, and then also bringing in an architecture model and, and massing mapping phases like that is just a pain in the butt. So for the most part, we're actually using um, design options. So um, hopefully that's helpful. What time is it? One fifteen. Oh, I just hit subscribe. There we go. <laughs> so one last thing I wanted to show you guys um, with this whole railing thing, because uh, again, as you can tell, I'm I'm super hyped about how how dramatically railings can help you um, um, build site models. Um, I'm gonna go back to this model here and just show you because I think it's a cool example of of combining everything. Um, so this this model has a little bit of everything. It has a, topo a topo surface. It has um, sub regions. It has just little masses in here that represent the buildings. Eventually they became more detailed, more subregions. It has railings here and railings here for the for the site fence, construction fence, all this good stuff, right? So if I go into this view, 
and I think I posed this question in the email. Um, utilities. <clears throat> so underground utilities are something that um, we have to model a lot for very, very different reasons, okay? Um, when it comes to just visually looking at them or visually having them there and not specific um, <laughs> specific, specific utilities, um, a really, really quick way, and I laid these utilities out in probably under an hour, probably less than an hour, probably like 30 minutes, I don't even know. Um, and what's really cool about these utilities is they were great for the, the visual, but what you'll notice is if I click them, guess what they are? They're railings. That's right. So let me let me hide the topography and show you exactly what's happening here. So while we were putting together this proposal, you know, they wanted to show they wanted to show all these utilities across this entire, you know, massive acre site. And I'm sitting there like, do I really want to sit there and do pipes and duct work and, and duct banks and inverts and do all this just to make this thing follow topography for the sake of proposal and showing that um, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna actually know where all this crap is, right? <laughs> so then I was like, well, what follows topography and does it easily? And and we can also add elements to, well, railings, right? So these railings are super simple. If I go into it, there is a circular hand rail profile I made, it's 10 inches. And then I have a material called stormwater, right? Then if I go into the baluster, guess what? I made a baluster called manhole. And instead of having it in between, I just had it at any any um, um, start post, corner post, and end post. Because guess what? That's probably where we're gonna have a manhole anyways. So look what these look like. If I just sit there and I draw from here to here to here to here to here to here to here, and I click finish, check that out. It makes a utility super, super fast, right? But even better, if I turn on topography, I can take this and I can say, I want to host a topography. And there it is there, right? So now this thing is following the topography. See how it's doing all this cool stuff here? And then I can just offset it. So let's just say, you know, this is down base offset, um, negative two feet, three feet. I don't remember how big this thing was, but I can say negative. So now you have something that's three feet below the surface following the exact profile of the topography. So yeah, this isn't great for um, if you're if you're actually modeling, you know, civil utilities for the sake of coordination, for example. But um, let's say you're modeling a an electrical, uh, I don't, not a duct bank, but something that that you know something that just requires a cover, for example. So maybe you have an electrical wire or duct that 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 or conduit that the only rule is it needs to be 36 inches below the surface. Guess what? You can use a railing, draw the path. And then just move it down 36 inches and you've got it. So you can actually use this for legit civil drawings. Obviously here, I wouldn't necessarily say that these are perfect because, you know, there's no inverts. There's just crazy things in between. But, but again, just a different way to think outside the box and make Revit site work for you. Okay. So pretty cool, right? Railings. Go figure. <laughs> All right. I think I saw a couple, a couple of questions. So let me go check this out. Um, um, uh, Alden was asking about geo reference and some of those. So, so today I didn't want to jump into to to um, coordinates and systems and geo referencing and all that other stuff. Okay, you know this is we're, this is just all about how you're going to physically model and mass the sites. Okay, when it comes to that kind of stuff, definitely check out the previous episode where I had uh, Nick on from Revit Peer and we talked about coordinate and shared coordinate systems. Um, ideally, you're working with your civil engineer or your or your surveyor to figure out. Um, how their files coming in, but if you're bringing in an image, and that's your file, I mean, geo referencing and figuring that out, good luck, right? I mean, I guess you could, but <laughs> so I'm not even, you know, I'm not even going to touch on that really. Um, just want to check to make sure. All right, any other questions, guys? This is this is awesome. You guys are some, some really cool questions here. Um, have you considered? So Matt was just asking about a computer. Little off topic, but he was asking about a computer. Um, computer setup. So I'm actually what you're seeing here is um, he asked about a 16 inch versus 17 inch laptop and um, larger screen area. So actually, you, the screen that you guys are seeing is not my 16 inch laptop screen. The screen you're seeing is a ViewSonic 27 inch uh, 2K monitor. Um, and so the reason I went 2K is first of all that's an amazing resolution, way better than 4K. It's, 4K just gets too small. <laughs> um, so you do get you get you definitely get more more screen area. 4K obviously I would get even more screen area, but um, you guys would never even be able to see it streaming. So that's why you may see the text is being a little bit smaller. So 
Uh, Alfredo, sorry, I'm I'm, uh, I'm late. <laughs> it's okay, Alfredo. You can check the replay afterwards. Jose said I should make a a, a railings T-shirt. Not a bad idea. Railings and curtain walls are just those two tools that are like, man. The amount of things that you can do thinking outside the box with those tools is absolutely incredible. And by the way, I mentioned somebody had a chat, um, a question in the chat about, but it's a railing still, it's not a wall. Well, if you check out my last session um, from two weeks ago with Aaron Mahler, um, which had to do with um, filters and, and and even his previous one where we talked about templates. Again, you can see all previous episodes going to live.bimafterdark.com. Um, but he mentioned, um, you know, using generic models as a starting point and all this other stuff. And the reality is he's using parameters to, to, to drive categories, essentially. So um, because Revit basically puts you in these boxes of categories, um, you feel like you have to use them. You have to use a roof for a roof. You have to use a wall for a wall. But the reality is you don't. All it is is one major category that's, that's looping these things into it. All you have to do is put a piece of data. I can go in here. Um, let's say I'm doing a takeoff. Right? Maybe I'm doing a takeoff of the site based on this. I can just go in here and I can even go in comments and say walls or wall. Right Now, whether I'm making a schedule, whether I'm using assemble, whether I'm using cost X, doesn't matter what I'm doing. I can just filter by comments equals wall. And now I know that I've got all my walls in here. I've got my site walls in there. So there's, there's you know, you don't have to be stricken or restricted by Revit's almighty category setup, right? So so take yourself out of that box and, and, and don't don't be afraid. All right, before before I wrap up, I'm just checking um, some of these chats here. Um, somebody asked about building pads. Uh, I'm not really sure what the question is about building pads, but yes, I use building pads. That's that's what I'm using here to cut holes in the ground. Um, you know, they're useful for certain different things. Um, you know, the only thing with building pads is I believe the only thing you can do is slope them. Um, so you can put a slope error. You can't actually modify the sub elements. So if you need to do something funky within a building pad, you can't. Um, and then Allah asked about sub hardscape pavings, uh, subregions. Yes. So for the most part, yes, subregions are the way to go. Um, in theory, though, in theory, um, if you guys really wanted to try, I, I don't see why you can't create curbs and sidewalks and even street profiles using railings. And it'd probably work better than the site designer tool. <laughs> so I, I haven't done that yet. But the reality is when you think about it, if you were to create a profile that was a long, skinny profile or maybe even had a crown in it and you, and you had to follow... You can probably utilize it and you might get some weird joints, but um, it's not a bad idea. Not a bad idea, actually. Um, and then um, Alfredo asked, yeah, Alfredo, check out the beginning. Um, um, I did cover some of the concrete, the walls and stuff like that that you saw there. Um, Steven asked, interior designer with linked models using railings for wall moldings. There you go. See, look at that. <laughs> it's kind of a cool idea. Um, the other thing I will mention too is um, you cannot host, um, and I know I just talked without showing you the screen. Sorry about that. Um, you can't you can't host multiple railings at a time. So if you have, um, uh, let's see here, if you have a whole bunch of 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 these railings here, so let's say let's say this striping and these three pieces were all drawn. Uh, da, 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 da. Come on. So let's say you had all these drawn and they weren't hosted. So if, if I say um, pick new host, oh, they're not going to unhost, are they? I'll just draw a new sketch. So if I draw a new sketch of this guy here, which is this fence, and let's say let's just say I, I, I'm in, I'm I'm running through and I'm making a, a bunch of them, or I'm copying and pasting like parking striping. One downfall is you can't you can't select all three of these and click pick new host. You have to select them one at a time. But of course, you can use Dynamo. And so um, I do have a Dynamo script. And again, I'll post this as a sample file to community members after this. Um, although I didn't open it beforehand. So uh, we'll see how this goes. While it's opening, I'm just gonna read real quick any, any chat on there. I probably uh, wasn't planning on showing this, but I thought about it. So let's just see. <laughs> <laughs> opening a, a dynamo script you haven't used in like four months uh during a live session is probably not the greatest idea but let's see uh, 
and then doing it from your VPN is probably not a good idea either. So let's just do railing. <clears throat> the striping has a horizontal baluster. The striping has no balusters. Um, so let me just check that out. Let me just, I'm just trying to find the script for you guys. Uh, change railing host. Here it is. Ta -da. It'd be a miracle if uh, I didn't need to update or something like that. <laughs> well, that's it. All right, so uh, so really simple. You just select the railings. So if I go under here, I'm gonna pull this off screen, just so you guys can see. So I just select select my railing families here. I select my topography here, and then unfortunately I couldn't find any any anything other than a a quick Python script, um, which is super simple. But um, found it online, and you just click run. And ta-da, all three of these are now hosted, okay? Super simple, super cool. Okay, the one last thing that um, I'll, I'll answer before we wrap up is um, the railing, so the striping, uh, the horizontal striping does not have any balusters. So if you go in here, you'll notice balusters is none, 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 none. All it is is a rail profile, okay? There's no reason to have a baluster. All right. Hopefully that's helpful. Cool, Ooh, man. I wasn't sure if I was gonna get it all in, so so that's pretty sweet. We got it all in an hour. Um, kind of. Let me let me know, guys. Let, let me know what you guys think of this time. Um, I think next week it's gonna be at night, just because I have a guest on. Um, it's kind of unique doing it at this time, you know, in, in between lunch hour and. I guess the biggest difference is I just have water instead of a cocktail, so I don't know. I don't know what's better or worse. I know some of you guys over over in Europe maybe have cocktails, but. <laughs> all right. So. Uh, Thanks again. I'm Jeff. Uh, thank you for joining me. I hope you guys enjoyed this topography uh, discussion. I really enjoyed the chat and the feedback. Um, make sure you check out free.bimafterdark for all my free resources. Check out live.bimafterdark for um, all the previous episodes. And then check out community.bimafterdark um, to get the sample files for this and become a member of a sweet community. We have over 100 members. Um, there's four full full length courses. There's a whole bunch of office hours and private office hours um, that we have together and a discussion board and sample files. So definitely check it out. Um, you guys are awesome. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, I'll see you next week. Um, have a great weekend. And uh, with that, I want to bid you all adieu. So cheers and uh, see you later. <laughs>